Good evening and welcome to the Shakespeare Underground. My name is Philip Hickman. I'm the artistic director here at Actors Theatre of Columbus. Now the Shakespeare Underground is our reading series of uh, interesting plays from throughout history. So this summer we are doing a series of shows um, that we're just calling Shakespeare's Apocrypha. They are shows that have been attributed to Shakespeare um, throughout history. Uh, may have had a couple of scenes written by Shakespeare. A couple of them are probably hoaxes. Uh, tonight's show is called The Puritan or The Widow of Watling Street. It was originally published in 1607 and part of the reason that it's attributed to Shakespeare is that it was published attributed to W.S. Now um, there were a few playwrights in England at the time with the, the initials W.S. including William Shakespeare but modern scholars think that the play was probably written by Thomas Middleton. Tonight's reading is directed by Sarah Marie Wilson. Of course, Actors Theatre would like to thank the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, the Columbus Foundation, the Rheinberger Foundation for all of their support. Specifically for the Shakespeare Underground, we would like to thank Viewtech Ruff HER Realtors and Regina Acosta Tobin with Metro Village Realty for helping us um, do this transition into the digital world. All right, so that's enough about the show. Sit back and enjoy. Nay, give him his due. He was indeed an honest, virtuous, discreet, wise man. He was my brother, as right as right. Oh, I shall never forget him, never forget him. He was a man so well given to a woman. Oh! Nay, but kind sister, I could weep as much as any man. But alas, her fears cannot call him again. Methinks you are well read, sister and know that death is a common name to all men. And for example, as there are examples abundance, did not Sir Humphrey Bubble die the other day? Oh, there's a lusty widow. Why, she cried not above half an hour. For shame, for shame. And then followed him old Master Folsom, the usurer. Oh, there's a wise widow. Why, she cried ne'er a wit at all. Dost <laughs> thou stand there and see us all weep, and not one shed a tear for thy father's death? Oh, thou ungracious son and heir, thou! Troth, mother, I should not weep. I'm past the child. I hope to make all my schoolfellows laugh at me. I should. Pray, let one of my sisters weep for me. I'll laugh as much for the her another time. Oh, thou past grace, thou! Out of my sight, thou graceless imp! Oh, thou stubborn only son, hadst thou such an honest man to thy father that would deceive us all the world to get riches for thee? And canst thou not afford a little salt water? Oh, dear husband! Weep, quotha? I protest, I'm glad he's churched. For now he's gone, I shall spend in quiet. Dear mother, pray cease. Half your tears suffice. Let me weep now. Oh, such a dear knight, such a sweet husband have I lost, have I lost. Sister, be of good cheer. We are all mortal ourselves. I come upon you fleshly. I ne'er speak without comfort. Hear me what I shall say. My brother has left you wealthy. You are rich. Oh? I say you are rich. You are also fair. Oh? Go to, you are fair. Well, the world is full of fine gallants. Choice one now, sister. For what should we do with all our knights, I pray, but to marry rich widows, wealthy citizens' widows, lusty, fair-browed ladies? Marry again! <laughs> No, let me be buried quick then, in that same part of the choir wherein I tread to such intent, oh, may it be my grave. 
and that the priest may turn his wedding prayers e'en with a breath to funeral dust and ashes. Oh, out of millions of millions, I should ne'er find such a husband. He was unmatchable, unmatchable. Sister, ne'er say so. He was an honest brother of mine. And so, and you might light upon one as honest again, or one as honest again may light upon you. That's the proper phrase indeed. Never. Oh, if you do love me, urge us not. Oh, may I be the common talk at table in the mouth of every groom and waiter, and if here I entertain the carnal suit of a man. And I vow never to marry, to sustain such loss as a dear husband seems to be once dead. I loved my father well too, but to say, nay, vow I would not marry for his death? Sure, I should speak false Latin, should I not? I'd as soon vow never to come in bed. Tut, women must live by the quick and not by the dead. Away, oh, my sweet husband, oh. My dear father. I think my mother weeps for all the women that ever buried husbands. For if from time to time all of the widower's tears in England had been bottled up, I do not think all would have filled a three halfpenny bottle. Well, I can mourn in good sober sort as well as another, but where I spend one tear for a dead father, I could give twenty kisses for a quick husband. My father's laid in dust, his coffin, and he is like a whole meat pie, and the worms will cut him up shortly. Farewell, old dad, farewell. Now, she would have me weep for him, forsooth. And why? Because he cousined the right heir, being a fool, and bestowed those lands on me, his eldest son. And therefore, I must weep for him? <laughs> I'll rule the roost myself. I'll be kept under no more. I know what I may do well enough by my father's copy. The law's in my own hands now. Nay, now I know my strength. I'll be strong enough for my mother, I warrant you. Oh, my friends! You are welcome to a smelling room here. You knew took leave of the air. Has it not a strange savor? As all prisons have smells of sundry wretches who, though departed, leave their scents behind him by gold, Captain. I am sincerely sorry for thee. Captain, what do you lie in for? Is it great? What's your offense? Faith, my offense is ordinary, common, a highway. And I fear me my penalty will be ordinary and common too. A halter. Nay, prophecy not so ill. It shall go hard, but I'll shift for thy life. Whether thy I live or die, thou art an honest George. I had a start out, and by chance set upon a fat steward, thinking his purse had been as uh, pursy as his body, notwithstanding being described, pursued, and taken. I know the law is so grim in respect of many desperate, unsettled soldiers that I fear I shall dance after their pipe for it. I am twice sorry for you, Captain. First, that your purchase was so small, and now that your danger is so great. Crush, the worst is but death. I have took note of thy fleers for a good while. If thou art minded to do me good, as thou gavest upon me comfortably and givest me charitable faces, which indeed is but a fashion in all who that are Puritans, wilt soon at night steal me my, that, my master's chain? Oh, I shall swoon! I know it to be worth three hundred crowns, and we have of that. I can buy my life at a broker's, a second hand, which now lies in pawn to the law. If this thou refuse to do, being easy and nothing dangerous, in that thou art held in good opinion of thy master, why, tis a palpable argument, thou holdest my life at no price. 
and these thy broken and unjointed offers are but only created on thy lip, now born and now buried. Foolish breath only. What? Won't do it? Shall I look for happiness in thy answer? Why, cousin, you know tis written, thou shalt not steal. Come, let me tell you. You are too unkind a kinsman, if faith. The captain loving you so dearly, I, like the prone water of his eye, and you to be so uncomfortable. Fie, fie. Pray, do not wish me to be hanged. Anything else that I can do, had it been to rob, I would have done it. But I must not steal. That's the word, the literal, thou shalt not steal. And would you wish me to steal then? No, Faith, that were too much to speak the truth. Why would thou nim it from him? That I will. Why enough? Bully, he shall be content with that or he shall had none. Let me alone with him now, Captain. I have dealt with your kinsman in a corner. A good, kind-natured fellow, methinks. Go to, you shall not ha have all your own asking. You shall bait somewhat on it. He is not contented absolutely, as you would say, to steal the chain from him, but to do you a pleasure, he will nim it from him. Aye, that I will, cousin. Well, seeing as he will do no more, as far as I see, I must be contented with that. When thou hast the chain, do but convey it out the back door into the garden, and there hang it close on a rosemary bank, and by that harmless device I know how to wind Captain Idle out of prison. The night thy master shall get his pardon and release him, and he satisfy thy master with his own chain. A wondrous thanks on both hands. That were rare indeed, Law. Pray, let me know how. Nay, tis very necessary thou shouldest know, because thou must be employed as an actor. A, an actor? Oh, no, that's a player, and our parson rails against the players mightily. I can tell you, because they brought him drunk upon stage once, as he will be horribly drunk. Why, as an intermeddler, then? Why, that, that. Give me audience, then. When the old knight thy master has raged his fill for the loss of the chain, tell him thou hadst a kinsman in prison whom will cause to fetch his chain, though twere hid under a mine of sea coal and ne'er make spade or pickaxe his instruments. Tell him but this. With father's instruction, thou shalt receive from me, and thou showest thyself a kinsman indeed. Nay, grace of God, I'll rob him on suddenly, hang it in the roseberry bank, but bear, bear that in mind, cousin, I would not steal anything. Methinks for my own father. Why, I thank thee. Fare thee well, I shall requite thee. Oh, I am happy in more slights, and one will knit strong in another. Corporal oath, skirmish, and I have a necessary talk for both of you. Lay it upon us, George Pieboard. I would have you two maintain a quarrel between the lady widow's door and draw your swords over the edge of the evening. Clash a little, clash, clash. Ah. Let us alone to make our blades ring noon, though it be after supper. Enough, my friends. Farewell. Uh, this prison shows as ghosts did part in hell. Not Mary? For swear marriage, why all women know tis an honorable thing to lie with a man. And I, to spite my sister's vow the more, have entertained a suitor already, a fine gallant knight of the last feather. He says he will coach me too, and well appoint me, and allow me money to dice withal, and many such pleasing protestations he sticks upon my lips. Indeed, his short-winded father in the country is wondrous wealthy, a most abominable farmer, and therefore he may do it 
in time. Troth, I'll venture upon him. Women are not without ways now to help themselves. If he prove wise and good as his word, why, I shall love him and use him kindly. And if he prove an ass, why, in a quarter of an hour's warning, I can transform him into an ox. Oh, there comes in my relief. Oh, but welcome, good Sir John. I thank you, Faith. Not forgetting the suite of new ceremonies, I first fall back, then recovering myself, make my honor to your lips thus. Trust me, very pretty and moving. You aren't worthy on, sir. Oh, my mother, my mother. Now she's here, we'll steal into the gallery. Oh, who comes a wooing you, I pray? And no small fool, a rich knight of the city, Sir Oliver Markill, no small fool, I can tell you. And furthermore, as I heard late by your maid servants, both your daughters are not without suitors. Aye, and worthy ones too. One a brisk courtier, Sir Andrew Tipstaff, suitor afar off to your eldest daughter, and the third, a huge, wealthy farmer's son, a fine young country knight. Oh, they call him Sir John uh, Pennydub. Aye, good name. Mary, what blessings are these, sister? Tempt me not, Satan. Satan? Do I look like Satan? I hope the devil's not so old as I. <laughs> you wound my senses, brother, when you name a suitor to me. Oh, I cannot abide it. I take in poison when I hear one named. Nay, hey, be patient, lady. We come in a way of honorable love. We do. To you. And to your daughters. Oh! Why will you offer me this, gentlemen? Indeed, I will not look upon you when the tears are scarce off on mine eyes, not yet washed off from my cheeks, and my dear husband's body scarce so cold as the coffin. I am not like some of your widows that will bury one in the evening and be sure to another ere morning. I have vowed never to marry, and so my daughters too. Uh, where be your daughters, lady? I hope they'll give us better encouragements. Indeed, they'll answer you so. <laughs> Take to my word, they'll give you the very same answer verbatim. Truly, la. Uh, well, lady, for this time we'll take our leaves, hoping for better comfort. By your leave, lady widow. What? Another suitor now? A suitor? No, I protest, lady. If you'd give me yourself, I'd not be troubled with you. So you so, sir? Then you're the better welcome, sir. Nay, heaven bless me from a window unless I were sure to bury her speedily. Good bluntness. Well, your business, sir. Very needful. Widow, I have been a mere stranger for these parts that you live in. Nor did I ever know the husband of you and father of them, but I truly know by certain spiritual intelligence that he is in purgatory. Purgatory? <laughs> the, the word deserves to be spit upon. I wonder that a man of sober tongue, as you seem to be, should have the folly to believe there's such a place. Well, lady, in cold blood I speak it. I assure you there is a purgatory. And in which place I know your husband resided, wherein he is like to remain till the dissolution of the world, till the last general bonfire, when all the earth shall melt into nothing, and the sea scalds their finny laborers so long his abidance, unless you alter the property of your purpose together with each of your daughters theirs. That is, the purpose of single life in yourself and your eldest daughter. 
and the speedy determination of marriage in your youngest. Strange, you should know our thoughts. Why, uh, but daughter, have you purposed speedy marriage? You see, she tells you I, for she says nothing. Nay, give me credit as you please. I am a stranger to you. And yet you see, I know your determinations, which must come to me metaphysically and by a supernatural intelligence. Know our secrets. I'd thought to steal a marriage. Would his tongue have dropped out when he blabbed it? Sir, my, my husband was too honest a dealing man to be now in any purgatories. Oh, do not load your conscience with untruths. He would scrape riches to him most unjustly. The very dirt between his nails was ill-got and not his own. Oh, I groan to speak on it. The thought makes me shudder. Shudder! Is this all your business with me? No, lady. Tis but the induction to it. That you shall perceive I know of things to come as well as I do. Of what is present, a brother of your husband's shall shortly have a loss for your part and your daughter's. If there be not once this day some bloodshed before your door, whereof the human creature dies, two of you, the elder, shall run mad. Oh! oh. That not I yet. And with most imprudent prostitution, show your naked bodies to the view of all beholders. Our naked bodies? Fie for shame! Attend me, and your younger daughter shall be struck and dumb. Dumb? Out, alas, tis the worst pain of all for a woman. I'd rather be mad or run naked or anything. Dumb? Give ear. Ere the evening fall upon hill, hog, and meadow, this my speech shall have the past probation, and then shall I be believed accordingly. This be true. We are all shamed, all undone. Dumb? I'll never speak as much as I can possibly before evening. But if it so come to pass, as for your fair sakes, I wish it may that this presage of your strange fortunes be prevented by that accident of death and bloodshedding, which I before you told of, take heed upon your lives, that two of you, which have vowed never to marry, seek out husbands with all present speed, and you, the third, that have such a desire to outstrip chastity, chastity look you meddle not with a husband. A double torment. The breach of this keep your father in purgatory, and the punishment that, that shall follow you in this world would, with horror, kill the ear should have hear him related. Mary! Why, I vowed never to marry. <laughs> so did I. And I vowed never to be such an ass but to marry. What a cross fortune this. Ladies... Though I be a fortune teller, I cannot better fortunes. You have them from me as they are revealed to me. I would they were to your tempers and fellows with your bloods. That is all the bitterness I would you. Dumb and not merry, worse, neither to speak nor kiss. A double curse. So this all comes well about yet. I play the fortune teller as well as if I had the witch to my grandnam, to conform my former presage to the widow. I have advised old Peter Skirmish, that the soldier to hunt corporal oath upon the leg, and if that foolish Nicholas St. Tatelings keep true time with the chain, my plot will be sound. The captain delivered and my wits applauded among scholars and soldiers forever. Oh, I have found an excellent advantage to take away the chain. My master put it off even now to say on a new doublet, and I sneaked it away little by little, most puritanically. We shall have a good sport anon. When he has missed it about my cousin, 
the conjurer. The world shall see I am an honest man of my word. For now, I'm going to hang it between heaven and earth amongst the rosemary bushes. How now, creatures? What's a clock? A clock? Mm, I passed 17. Thou dost not bulk or baffle me, doest thou? I am a soldier, past seventeen. Aye, thou art not angry with the figures, art thou? I will prove it unto thee. Twelve and one is thirteen, I hope. A two fourteen, three fifteen, four sixteen, and five seventeen. Then past seventeen, I will take the dial's part in a just cause. I say tis but past five, then. I'll swear tis past seventeen, then. Doest thou not know numbers? Canst thou not cast? Cast? Dost thou speak of my casting in the street? Aye, and in the marketplace. No. Oh, villain! Thou hast opened a vein in my leg. Oh no, for shame, for shame. Put up, put up. Twas out of my part, George, to be hurt on the leg. Oh, wondrous happiness beyond our thoughts. Oh, lucky fair event. I think our fortunes were blessed in our cradles. We are quitted of all those shameful, violent presages by this rash, bleeding chance. Go, frailty. Run and know whether he be yet living or yet dead. That here before my door received his hurt. Sure that man is a rare fortune teller. Never looked upon our hands, nor any mark about us. A wondrous fellow, surely. I am glad to have the use of my tongue yet, though of nothing else. I shall find a way to marry, too. I hope shortly. Oh, where's my brother Sir Godfrey? I would he hear that I might relate to him how prophetically the cunning gentleman spoke in all things. <laughs> oh, my chain! My chain! I have lost my chain! Where be these villains? Violets! Oh, he's lost his chain! My chain! My chain! Uh, brother, be patient! Hear me, me speak. You know I told you that a cunning man told me that you should have a loss, and he has prophesied so true! Ouch! He's a villain to have prophesied the loss of my chain! T'was worth above three hundred crowns! Besides, it was my father's, my father's father's, my grandfather's huge grandfather's. I had his life had lost the neck as the chain that hung about it. Oh, my chain, my chain. Oh, brother, who can be guarded against so much fortune? Tis happy t'was no more. Delusion. Now, wrong Nicholas, where's my chain? Oh, why, about your neck, is it not, sir? About my neck? Violet, my chain is lost. Tis stole away. I'm robbed. Nay, brother, show yourself a man. Aye, if it be lost or stole, if he would be patient, mistress, I could bring him to a cunning kingsman of mine that would fetch it with his sarasra. Canst thou? I will be patient. Say, where dwells he? Mary, he dwells now, sir, where he would not dwell if he could choose. In the Marshalsea, sir. But he's an excellent fella if he were out. Has traveled the world o'er. He has been in seven and twenty provinces. Why, he would make it be fetched, sir, if twere rid a thousand miles out of town. An admirable fellow. What lies he for? Why, he did but rob a steward of ten groats the other night, as any man would have done, and there he lies for it. I'll make his peace. A trifle. I'll get his pardon, beside a bountiful reward. Good sister, pardon me. All will be well, I hope, and turn to good in the name the conjurer has laid my blood.
Captain, my device leans to thy happiness. For ere the day be spent to the girdle, thou shalt be set free. <laughs> what rests is all in thee to conjure, Captain. George, I know not what to say to it. Conjure? I shall be hanged ere I can conjure. Nay, tell me none of that, Captain. Uh, you'll never conjure after you're hanged, I warrant you. Look you, sir. A parlous matter, sure. First, spread your circle upon the ground with a, a, conjur a conjuring ceremony. Um, as I'll have a hackney man's wand silvered over a purpose for you, then arriving in the circle with a huge word and a great trample, as for instance, have you never seen a stalking and stamping player that will raise a tempest with his tongue and thunder with his heels? Yes, 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 often, <laughs> often. Why, be like such a one for anything will blear the old knight's eyes. For you must note that he'll never dare to venture into a room, only perhaps peep fearfully through the keyhole to see how the play goes forward. Well, I may go about it when I will, but mark the end on it. I shall but shame myself. If faith, George, speak big words and stamp and stare, and he look in at the keyhole, why the very thought of that would make me laugh outright and spoil all. Why then, think upon going to the hanging else. He's come, he's come. I understand that you are my kinsman's good master, and in regard of that, the best of my skill is at your service. But had you fortuned a mere stranger and made no means to me by acquaintance, I should have utterly denied to have been the man, both by reason of the act passed in Parliament against conjurers and witches, and also because I would not have my art vulgar, trite, or common. I much commend your care therein, good Captain Conjurer, and that I will be sure to have it private enough. You shall do it in my sister's house, mine own house, I, I may call it, for both our charges therein are proportioned. Very good, sir. Oh, what may I call your loss, sir? Oh, you may call it a great loss, a grievous loss, sir, as good a chain of gold, though I say it, as he that wore it. To lose such a fair chain of gold were a foul loss. Well, I could put you in this good comfort on it. If it be between heaven and earth, night, I'll have her for you. The oh, wonderful conjurer. Oh, why, it is between heaven and earth, I warrant you. It cannot go out of the realm. I know it is somewhere above the earth, for first my chain was rich, and no rich thing shall enter into heaven, you know. No, sir, to come to the point indeed, you see I stick here in the jaw of the marshal sea, and cannot do it. Tut, tut, I know thy meaning. Thou wouldst say, thou art a prisoner. I tell thee, thou art none. How oh, none? Why is this not the marshal sea? Wouldst thou hear me speak? I heard of thy rare conjuring. My chain was lost. I sweat for thy release, as thou shalt do the same. Do the like at home for me. Keeper? Sir. Speak. Is this not, is not this man free? Yes, at his pleasure, sir. The fees discharged. Go, go, I'll discharge them. I thank your worship. Now trust me, you are a dear knight. Kindness unexpected. Oh, there's nothing to a free gentleman. I will conjure you, sir, to frock come through my buff jerkin. By your leave, master fortune teller, I had a glimpse on you at home, at my sister's the widow's. There you prophesied the loss of a chain. Oh, simply though I stand here, I was he that lost it. Was it you, sir? I, 
that will be the end on it. For will the curse of the beggar prevail so much that the sun shall consume that foolish tree the, which the father got craftily? Aye, aye, aye. It will, it will, it will. So I must crave your patience to bestow this day upon me, that I may furnish myself strongly. I sent a spirit into Lancashire the other day to fetch back a knave drover, and I look for his return this evening. Tomorrow morning, my friend here and I will come and breakfast with you. Oh, you shall both be most welcome. And about noon, without fail, I propose to conjure. Conjuring? Do you mean to conjure at our house tomorrow, sir? Merry I do, sir. Tis my intent, young gentleman. By my troth, I'll love you while I live for it. Oh, Rab, Nicholas, we shall have conjuring tomorrow. I, I could have told you that. Uh, do you hear, sir? I desire more acquaintance on you. You shall earn some money of me now. Now I know you can conjure. But can you fetch anything that is lost? Oh, anything that's lost. Why, look you, sir. I, I tell it to you as a friend and as a conjurer. I should marry an apothecary's daughter, and was was told to me she had lost her maiden head at Stony Stratford. Now, if you'll do but so much as conjure for it, make it whole again. But I will, sir. Oh, by my troth, I thank you, La. But I hope you will not serve a knight so, gentlewoman, will you? To cashier him and cast him off at your pleasure. But what, do you think I was dubbed for nothing? No, by my faith, lady's daughter. Pray, Sir John Pennydub, let it be deferred a while. I have as big a heart to marry you as can have, but the fortune teller told me that- the Fox of the fortune teller! Would Derek have been his fortune seven years ago to cross my love thus? Did he know what case I was in? Why, this is able to make a man drown himself in his father's fish pond. And then he told me moreover, Sir John, that the breach of it kept my father in purgatory. In purgatory? Why, let him purge out his heart there. What have we to do with that? How can he hinder our love? Why, let him be hanged now that he's dead. Well, have I rid post day and nights to bring you merry news of my father's death, and now... Thy father's death? Your old, the old farmer is dead? As dead as his barn door, Maul. And you'll keep your word with me now, Sir John, that I shall have my coach and my coachman? Aye, faith. And two white horses with black feathers to draw it? Two? A guarded lackey to run before it, pied liveries to come trashing after it? Thou shalt, Maul. <laughs> and to let me have money in my purse to go whither I will. All this. Then come. Whatsoever comes on will be made sure together before the maids at the kitchen. Bless you, sweet lady. And you, fair mistress. Good. What do you mean, gentlemen? Fie, did I not give you your answers? Sweet lady. Well, I will not stick with you now for a kiss. Daughter, kiss the gentleman for once. Yes, first sooth. I'm proud of such a favor. Truly, La, Sir Oliver, you're much to blame to come again when you know my mind, so well delivered as widow could deliver a thing. But I expect a, a father comfort. Why Wait. are you now? Did I not desire you to put off your suit quite and clean when you came to me again? How say you? Did I not? But the sincere love which my heart bears you... Go to you, I'll cut you off, and Sir Oliver, to put you in comfort afar off, my fortune is read me. I must marry again. Oh, blessed fortune. But not as long as I can choose. Nay, I'll hold out well.
Yet my hopes are now fairer. Faith, Mistress Francis, I'll maintain you carefully. I'll bring you to court. We knew among the, the fair society of ladies, poor quick kinswoman of mine, in, in cloth of silver, besides, you shall have your, your monkey, your, your parrot, your musk cat. It will do very well. And please, you gentlemen, to walk a while in the garden, go gather a pink or a gillyflower. With all our hearts, lady, and count us favoured. I can tell you, Captain, simply though it lies here, tis the fairest room in my mother's house, as dainty a room to conjure in, methinks. Uh, why, you may bid I cannot tell how many devils welcome in it. My father has had twenty here at once. What? Devils? Oh. Uh. Uh, how if the devil should prove a knave and tear the hangings? I, <laughs> Nuncle, or spit fire upon the ceiling. Very true, too, for tis but thin plastered and will quickly take hold of the lives. And if he chance to spit it downward, too, he will burn all the boards. I fall to your circle, will not trouble you. Uh, I warrant you, uh, come, uh, we'll to the next room. And because we'll be sure to keep him out here, uh, we'll bar up the door with some of the godly zealous works. Now! Now! Now, Captain! What <laughs> conjurer! What wouldst thou with me? So, 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 I'll release thee. Enough, Captain. Allow us some time to laugh a little. They're shuddering and shaking by this time as if an earthquake were in their kidneys. Sir George, how was it? How was it? Did I, did I, did I do well enough? Wilt believe me, Captain, better than any conjurer. For here was no harm in this, and yet their horrible expectations satisfied well. You were much beholding to thunder and lightning at this time. It graced you well, I can tell you. All's past now, only to revel that the chains in the garden, where thou knowest it is, has lain these two days. Sir Godfrey! Nicholas! Kinsman! Split the vast island still! George! Sir Godfrey! Oh, is that the devil's voice? How comes he to know my name? Fear not, Sir Godfrey, all's quieted. Well, what, is he laid? Laid and has newly dropped your chain in the garden. In the garden? Our garden? Your garden. Oh, oh sweet conjurer. Oh, whereabouts there? Ah, look well about a bank of rosemary. Oh, sister, the rosemary bank. Oh, come, come, there's my chain, he says. Oh, happiness, run, run. I, I have my chain again, my chain's found again. Oh, sweet captain, oh, admirable conjurer. Oh, captain, my joy is such, I know not how to thank you. Let me embrace you, hug you. Oh, my sweet chain gladness makes me guinea. Oh, rare man, t'was just to the rosemary bank as one should have laid it there. Oh, cunning, cunning. Well, seeing my fortune tells me I must marry, let me marry a man of wit. A man of parts. <laughs> he is a worthy captain, and tis a fine title, truly, la, <laughs> to be a captain's wife. <laughs> a captain's wife? <laughs> it goes very finely. Beside, all the world knows that a worthy captain is a fit companion to any lord. Then why not a sweet bedfellow to any lady? <laughs> I'll have it so. <laughs> Well, seeing I am enjoined to love and marry, my foolish vow I cashier to air, which first begot it. Now, love, play thy part, 
the scholar reads his lecture in my heart. This is the marriage morning for my mother and sister. I shall have a simple father-in-law, a brave captain able to beat all our street, Captain Idol. Now my lady mother will be fitted for a delicate name, my, my lady Idol. My lady Idol, the finest name that can be for a woman. And then the scholar, Master Pieboard, for my sister Frances. That will be Mistress Frances Pieboard. Mistress Frances Pieboard, they'll keep a good table, I warrant you. Now all the knights' noses are put out of joint. They may go to a bone setter's now. Hark, hark, oh, who comes here now with two torches before him? My sweet captain and my fine scholar. Oh, how bravely they are shot up in one night. They look like fine Britons now, methinks. Here's a gallant change, if faith. Slid they have hired men and and all by the clock. <laughs> Master Edmund, kind, honest, dainty Master Edmund. Oh, sweet Captain Father-in-law, a rare perfume of faith. What, are the brides stirring? May we steal upon them, thinkest thou, Master Edmund? For they're even upon readiness, I can assure you, for they were at their torch even now. By the same tum token, I tumbled down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, poor Master Edmund. Oh, the musicians! I pray thee, Master Edmund, call them in and let go of a little. <laughs> that I will, sweet Captain Father-in-law, and make each of them as drunk as a, a common fiddler. Whew. A Mistress Mall! A Mistress Mall! Who's there? Uh, Tis I. Who? Oh, Sir John Pennydub, who'd have thought you'd be such a rare stirrer? Uh, prithee, Maul, uh, let me come up. No. By my faith, Sir John, I'll keep you down, for you knights are very dangerous if you once get above. I'll not stay, if faith. If faith, you shall stay. For, Sir John, you must take note of the nature of your climates. Your northern wench in her own country may well hold out till she be fifteen, but if she touched the south once and come up to London, here the chimes go presently after twelve. Oh, thou'rt a mad wench, Maul, but I prithee make haste, for the priest has gone before. Do you follow him? I'll not be long after. By your leave, lady. My lord, your honor is most chastely welcome. Madam, though I came now from court, I come not to flatter you, for it is the property of all you that are widows, a handful accepted, to hate those that honestly and carefully love you, to the maintenance of credit, state, and posterity, and strongly to dote on those that only love you to undo you. And if there be but one man amongst ten thousand millions of men that is accursed, disastrous, and evilly planted, whom fortune beats most, whom God hates most, and all societies esteem least, that man is sure to be a husband. Such is the peevish moon that rules your bloods. Witness those two deceitful monsters that you have entertained for bridegrooms. Deceitful? For what they have besotted your easy blood with all were not but forgeries. The fortune telling for husbands, the conjuring for the chain Sir Godfrey heard the falsehood of, all nothing but mere knavery and deceit. Oh, wonderful indeed. I wondered that my husband with all his craft could not keep himself out of purgatory. And I more wondered that my chain should be gone and my tailor had none of it. And I wondered most of all that I should be tied for marriage, having such a mind to it. Come, Sir John Pennydub, fair weather on our side. The moon has changed since yesternight. Sting of evil, of every evil, is within me. And that you may perceive I feign not with you, Behold their fellow actor in those forgeries, who, full of spleen and envy at their so sudden advancements, revealed all their plot in anger. Base soldier, to reveal us! It's poor 
possible we should be blinded so and our eyes open? Widow, will you now believe that false which too soon you believed true? Oh, to my shame I do. But under favour, my lord, my chain was lost, truly lost, and, and strangely found again. Resolve him of that, soldier. Nay, I'll prove it. For the chain was but hid in the rosemary bank all this while, and thou gottest him out of prison to conjure for it. Who did it admirably, for sanely, for indeed what need any others when he knew it was there? Oh, villainy of villainies! Oh, but how came my, how came my chain there? Where's truly law, indeed law? He that will not swear but lie, he that will not steal but rob, pure Nicholas St. Tantlings. Oh, villain, one of our society, a Puritan, a thief. When was it ever heard? Nay, knight, dwell in patience. And now, widow, being so near the church, twere great pity, nay, uncharity, to send you home again without a husband. Come, lady, and you, virgin, bestow your eyes and your purest affections upon men of estimation both in court and city that have long wooed you and both with their hearts and wealth sincerely love you. Oh, good sister, do. Sweet little Frank, these are men of reputation. You shall be welcome at our a great credit for a citizen. Pardon me, worthy sirs. I and my daughter have wronged your loves. Tis easily pardoned, lady, if you vouchsafe it now. With all my soul. And I with all my heart. And I, Sir John, with soul, heart, lights, and all. They are all mine, Maul. Now, lady, what honest spirit but will applaud your choice and gladly furnish you with hand and voice? A happy change, which makes even heaven rejoice. Come, enter into your joys. You shall not want for fathers now, I doubt it not, believe me, but that you shall have hands enough to give you. 